What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Eastern Current. We've taken a break. We've had two little breaks here over the holidays. We didn't do an episode the week of Thanksgiving, and we didn't do an episode um, Christmas week, which was this past week. Today's actually uh, New Year's Eve, and tomorrow's January 1st. No. So me and Mike are here. You know, we're getting into January, late winter. It's crazy how quickly the fall went by. Don't you think? Just gone. Just absolutely gone so quick. I trout fish for the beginning of November, and then it's just kind of been duck hunting. But, um, you know, this time of year, we're entering, you know, one of Mike and I's favorite times of the year to target redfish. Um, And this time of year can require you to be a good steward of the fishery because, I mean, if you find some of these big wintertime um, redfish schools that we're going to talk about right now, like, you can sit there and catch the mess out of them. And I always share with people, like, one, you know, it it almost feels better to just go catch a couple and leave and and whatnot. This is already getting into the podcast. Um, We'll we'll jump into this more. Let me me do the pre-show stuff first, actually. So go check out our Facebook group, Eastern Current Fishing. It's growing like crazy. It's a great resource for you all to connect with other listeners. To connect with us, ask any questions, you know, drop some ideas of what y'all want to hear on the podcast. Um, also, go check us out on Instagram. It's just Eastern Current um, on Instagram, mm-hmm. right? Isn't that what it is? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, just look up Eastern Current. You'll find it. Um, and then also go check us out on Patreon. We are now on every one of these episodes at the end. We're, we're diving a little deeper into what we feel, you know, is maybe one of the or, or the most important part of each podcast. Uh, and sharing that on our Patreon page. So you can either donate $5 a month or $10 a month. That really helps us. We invest a lot of time recording, but also editing, also on the Instagram um, page and the Facebook page. And so it just, you know, it, it lets us know that, that y'all are, you know, digging what we're putting out. And uh, we really do appreciate it. But we're going to have extra content, you know, deep dive on there. Today we're actually going to go into like specifically what we look for in an area that's going to hold redfish in the wintertime. So like the you know, the key to the puzzle. It's like, once you find them, you can put everything we're going to share in the podcast to use. But like on Patreon, we're going to tell y'all exactly where to go look for them and how to find them. So go check us out over there on Patreon. Uh, The links for that will be on the show notes of the podcast uh, or on the podcast platforms, as well as over on the YouTube channel um, in the description. So uh, without, without any more of that, we'll, we'll kind of get back into what we're saying. Like, I think before we get into this at all, it's like, in the winter, you know, when you find fish, you find them pretty schooled up, whether it's trout, black drum, redfish. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, these shallow water redfish, if you want them to last through the winter for you, yeah, you don't pound them. You go in there and you catch four or five fish and you say, hey, that was awesome. And, yeah. and you get back. And, and a lot of times, sometimes on guide trips, you know, we'll pull up, we'll catch one or two, back off of them, hang out, eat our lunch for a second, and then pull back in there. You know, we're we're grinding on these half-day trips, you know, on these, these schools of fish and um, nobody owns these fish, but I, in a way we all own them. And yeah. so, so taking good care of them, not beating them up, not chasing them around too much. It'll just, all I'm saying is it'll give us all more of an opportunity to catch these fish, you know, longer and longer. And it's a great time of year to not necessarily keep too many redfish either. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, once you start pressuring them, you're catching five, six, seven, eight out of a school at a time in a week, week and a half, they're, they're gone. Yeah. They're going to go find somewhere else where people aren't messing with them. Aren't, you know, running up on them with their boat, pushing them around, pushing them out of where they want to be at. So, you know, like Judd said, if you want them to last more than a week or two, go get one, go get two, have fun knowing that you found them, you outsmarted them, you got in front of them, whether you're throwing the spin rod or, you know, sight fishing with a fly rod, whatever it is, you've won, you've won, you found them, you know, you fed them, whatever it is that you were, you know, you've caught them. Definitely. So... I agree 100%, man. It's it's easy to sit there and catch too many of them. And it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing. We're not no. trying to be the fish police, but we're just <laughs> trying to help, you know, keep these fish in a safe, happy area that we can catch them all winter long. So yeah. that's our spiel on that. Um, I've seen fish stick around for, you know, months from yeah. now until mid-April when they're just, you know, when they're not too too pounded and there's a lot of people especially in our area and i know from virginia all the way down to florida obviously but even georgia south carolina north carolina it's a lot more skiffs a lot more people with access to shallow water and polling Mm -hmm. um and even just you know smaller boats on the trolling motor boats are getting shallower and shallower fit more and more people are getting into that and so if you think you're the only person pressuring a group of fish you're probably not um i found more times than not i'm like golly i'm the only one that knows about this group and (laughs) i roll in there one day and like five different boats try to come in um, uh, and so that that's just me sharing that with you. Also, in the wintertime, if you know of a school of fish and you run to them and there's already somebody else on them, 
just let them have them. Don't go yeah. in there and try to ping pong them back and forth and beat up on them as well. Like, you know, the, the etiquette is to let them be. And also, yeah. you're drawing more attention to that area and that spot. If there's two boats fishing somewhere in January or February, yeah. you know, you pretty much know, all right, there must be some fish there. I was up on a noose the other day, and there there was a ton of people trout fishing uh, Pungo Creek, which is where we were, mm. were hanging out. And uh, let me, there we go. Um, trout fishing Pungo Creek, and there was one spot with like twelve boats within fifty yards, all sitting around this little creek mouth, just casting to it. And I'd never even even <clears throat> trout fished Pungo Creek, and I was like, I know exactly where those fish are. So oh. sorry, guys. It, th- those of y'all that are listening, we're recording on my computer, and this whole reminder just popped up. I'm trying to get rid of it. It did really. There we go. Awesome. So, so let's talk about. You know, what drives these fish to school in the wintertime? The biggest thing is water temperature. Yeah, it, um, it is. You know, once the water temperature hits, I'd say probably the mid-60s. Yeah. You know, once it really starts dropping out of the 70s, but once it hits that mid-60s mark, I think that's kind of that big trigger. You're going to find fish, you know, low 70s, upper 60s, where they're already starting to group, but they're not, they're not in a massive wad yet. Yeah. You know, they're maybe 10, 15 fish here and there, but their mindset is, all right, temperature's dropping, start grouping up, start grouping up, start grouping up. And I think the biggest thing, we've talked about this in other podcasts, is kind of those transition zones and stuff where you're finding them moving to these areas. Yeah, agreed. So. Agreed. um, It's, uh, It's easy to, you know, to think that there's a specific spot, a specific time of year that yeah. these fish are going to be at. And there is, but it, it's a matter of, you know, you looking through lots of areas and, and different temperatures will trigger them. Like there was a group of fish that I found the other day in a spot that I see them year after year that were there for three days. Yep. Um, you know, they came in, that water temperature dropped even harder and they went back out into the ocean within three days. It was about 800 fish in one area. Good gosh. Um, and, and they were in and out based off of that water temperature. Yeah. And this time of year is a great time of year, more so than I think any other time of year, to start really keeping notes. Yep. And, and <laughs> you know, the temperatures, the moon phases, because, you know, it'll just help you think like, oh, yeah, that spot up there by that island, they showed up, you know, at the first week of January when the water temperature was this. Yep. Um, but, I mean, I know, you know, this time of year, Janu- first week of January can be 75 degrees like it is outside right now, or it can be... 20. Well, and I was going to say, you t- at this time of year, you see a wild temperature swing daily almost sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, these fish, they get one mindset and then they're back to something else because of weather changes, pressure changes, whatever it is that keys your group of fish to move to these certain areas. You know, it they could be there, like you said, a day and they may get halfway to where they want to go. Weather changes the next day and they're gone, yeah. you know, and they're back out. And a lot of times, like we've talked before, the transition zones that you may find them in or whatever, they're they're there, they're waiting to make the move, but once that happens, they're back out and they're not feeding right. during that time. Right. So, you know, it's it becomes a really tough game of trying to find them, locate them, and get them where, they, where you need them to be. 100%. So. 100%. It's a, it's a fun time of year to fish for them, but it's also so, a, a time of year where, like, when I first really started guiding and really spending a lot of time on redfish, like I only focused on shallow water redfish. Yep. Um, and this is a time of year that it's nice to be able to diversify and look for fish uh, in deeper water, yeah, um, yeah. off the beach, in the ocean. There's, I mean, on the past two podcasts we talked about, we talked a good bit about, um, and I, this was with Elias and with Zane. We talked about you know some of that near shore red fishing in the winter. Yep. Um, on some of the ARs and in the surf and on the jetties and and that's key and there's great ways to fish for those fish with artificials as well which we, we know we talked with Elias a little bit about that and we'll probably share on that in the podcast a little bit our main focus is going to be these creek fish these yep. inshore fish but you know right now we just had a really 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 cold pop you know mm-hmm. or like an extended cold pop where the water just continued to yeah. slowly drop um, we've got two or three warm days, so that water is going to pop back up. I'm expecting some of these areas where these fish were maybe two weeks ago for them to show back up, at least for a yeah. short period of time. Um, and, and I, you know, I know Michael, there's a spot that me and Mike like to fish a lot. The other day you were out and you found them in transition, like moving from the mm-hmm. inlet into an area that you like to fish. And Yeah. I fished for an hour and a half, never spooked them, never even got close to them, and 
could not get them to eat. Yeah, isn't that crazy? It was just tough. But other places that, you know, we have wintertime fish that we know about, you know, they were sitting there. They were happy. You know, we caught three or four, and it was time to roll out. So um, That's crazy. It's just finding the key for that group or that area and what makes it happen for them. A lot of times you get into, as you learn a school of fish in the winter, because they're hanging out, let's let's just say like an average school might move 100 yards up and down a creek through a deep yeah. section, shallow section, kind of back and forth with the tide. And just, you know, even watching them, you know, when they're unaffected by the boat, mm-hmm. they kind of glide back and forth between areas, um, or not glide, but swim. Um, and, and so understanding those fish and what part of that creek or that little zone they like to feed in and what part mm-hmm. they like to just swim in. I mean, there's definitely, you can get that nitpicky to where like, I'm just going to sit down here right at the transition of like, a lot of times it's the transition from shallow to deep yep. where they feed well. Mm-hmm. They'll sit in that deep hole and they'll feed. All right. You'll catch some fish. They'll get up real shallow. Some days they're fired up up there, but like if you can get them when they're kind of hanging out in that transitionary shallow to deep this time yep. of year where that water's warming just a little bit, like today, they would be fired up. They'd be eating really well. So, oh, yeah. um, the other thing too is when it gets really cold, a lot of what you still see stay around is the smaller fish. Yeah, you know, you'll have some bigger ones, but the really, really cold snaps, those little ones will will stay in, but they're just not quite programmed to go out in the ocean yet. No, yeah, I was gonna say the the little rat reds, fifteen, sixteen inches, is kind of you might see schools of several hundred of those fish sitting in one area yeah. and it's as cold as all get out outside, but you will not find bigger fish for sure. Yeah. So, and I don't know if that's, like you said, they're just not keyed to go out and either sit in the surf, sit in deeper water off of, you know, something like the jetty or near shore right. or, you know, a size comfortability or, you know, but yeah, definitely it, it's a, you know, certain times of, of this season, you'll find them all potted up different sizes, but when it's really cold, more times than not, it, it's the smaller ones with a few big ones mixed in. You get yeah. in those puppy drum. The, the bigger fish go sit in the inlets and around the jetties and, and on the structure and whatnot. And, and the other big thing, too, here, here's another really important factor. We're just kind of you know snowballing through this. <laughs> but birds, man. Like if you are running mm-hmm. through the marsh this time of year and you see a bunch of diver ducks sitting around and you see a bunch of um, cormorants or herrings in a certain area – you know that means there's at least bait there. And Mm -hmm. if there's bait in that area, there's a really good chance that um, there's redfish schools somewhere nearby. They're they're kind of all the bait, the big mullet, the small mullet, the glass minnows, the redfish, the flounder, the trout, they're all going to be in concentrated areas. Like we say all the time, in the winter, 99% of the fish are in like 2% of the water. Yeah. So, it, you know, think about it that way. Don't just slowly pick your way through an area. Like, I work stuff really quickly this time yeah. of year until I find the fish. And the nice thing is it's super clear. So yeah. you can... You can uh, You're going to know really quickly if you bump them, push them, spook them. Don't, don't be upset. Don't be mad about it. Take back out of that area. Go fish somewhere else. Come back, you know, a few hours yeah. later or something. Now you know where they're... You know where they were at. Yeah. So, you know, you can kind of start picking that area apart and figuring out the fish a little better. Definitely. You know? Definitely. So. And, you know, like a lot of times what we talked about too is like you, you, even if you do bump them and spook them, they won't leave an area completely this time of year. And the water's clear enough. You can usually see them. They're creatures of habit. So, like Mike said, back off, give them some time, come back um, and try to try to figure them out then. So, um, and call us and tell us where they are (laughs) and we'll come help you figure out how to catch them. And don't feel like you're, if you go out and you're looking for these fish, don't feel bad if you go out and don't find fish like weekend one or weekend two. There was one time when, and I don't know if you remember this in college, this might have even been before we had the IPV skiff, but we spent three weeks going through the marsh. Yeah. I remember three that. weeks in January, fishing probably every other day, every three days searching for fish before we found our first school of wintertime redfish yeah that was and, that was a tough winter that ended up being a really good winter yeah that and was crazy once we figured out the what you know where they were at the one school it kind of gave us that idea all right this is where we need to go look here this is where we need to go look here you know it kind of started all the little puzzle pieces started falling into place but you know three weeks sometimes a month you know it just takes time but now that we've 
figured those little things out, you know, we're able to kind of go run and check different spots. So until you build that confidence, until you kind of start putting those puzzle pieces together, it might be really, really, really frustrating at first. But it, they are there, and you can find them. Yeah. You know, you know it's a double-edged sword because it's nice that you can see everything so well. It, but yeah. it, it limits your or my motivation to fish until I 100% know they're in there. Yeah. You know, like I'm going to kind of work through an area quickly, not making a ton of casts until I see fish. Mm -hmm. um, and just pick a section of marsh and learn the whole thing this time of year. It's clear bottom. You can see you're not going to get stuck. I mean, you could get stuck, but you're not going to run across the sandbar you didn't see. Yeah. Um, you know, pick an area of marsh and, and, and knock it off your list. If they're there, catch them. If they're not, then pick another area of marsh and go work through it each time. And, you know, even if you don't find the mother load of redfish and crush it, you're, you're becoming a, a better angler just by learning that piece of marsh and knowing they're not there, you know, and, and that's just as important as knowing that they are there. So, yep. you, you know, you get that limited time on the water, knowing where to go and when to be there is important, but you're not going to learn new spots by going to the old ones that you fished. So. Yep. Well, I would say too, like right now is a great time, like you said, with the water being clear and we're having super low tides with moon phase and just our, you know, fall and winter time, we have a super low tides in general. Um, so this is a great time to go out and learn, okay, there's oyster bars here or, you know, there's a transition or a drop off or a deep hole or something that I didn't see this summer. Right. And now when it comes summertime, springtime, flounder start moving back in, you know, those transition zones or, you know, that oyster bar where, you know, some trout can sit on and stuff for next winter, whatever it is, you're able to start putting those puzzle pieces together for a lot more other fish, you know, yeah. but yeah, definitely. It's a. Uh... It is crazy how many flounder you'll start to find in the spring too. Like as it starts to warm a little bit, you're you're throwing these casts into these groups of redfish or in a deep hole or something like that where you think there's some redfish and you get whacked. You're like, oh yeah, they're in there. And you reel it up and it's a you know a big flounder that's in the in the marsh. So all that life congregates this time of year. Birds, yeah. fish, bait. Uh, it, it's pretty it's pretty crazy. It's cool. It's cool to see kind of how those ecosystems play off of each other. Definitely. Um, well, let's move into you know, what, you know, we find some fish, mm -hmm. what's the best way to approach these fish in clear water um, and kind of how to, how to fish to them. And then we'll move into, you know, bait selection and what we're going to throw to them. Huh. Um, I think for me, once I find a school, when the power pole comes into play big time. Yes. Um, when I find a school of fish, you know, I don't want to move and chase them around the area. So I will take like Judd said and like nose my boat up and put power pole down and I'll sit I might only get a shot at those fish every 30, 45 minutes when they're making their their moves in this zone. But I know I'm quiet. I'm not walking around all over the boat. I'm not pushing water. Very little pressure on the fish. That yeah. Way. And those fish will stay happy. And every time they come around, you, you're you not guaranteed. But it's pretty darn good chance that you're going to yeah. get a shot. Or the less you interact fish. with them for, by bumping them with the boat. When we say mm -hmm. bump them, we mean like... They're swimming happily, and then they bump. They they feel us, and they move away from the boat. They wake away. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's what we that's what we call bumping them. Yeah, and you'll you'll see them get up, and it's a great way to like whenever you find a school of fish and part to the side or sit off. You know, yeah. I find what area of their zone that they're not using the most. You know, right. the, where you're still within reach, reach casting distance. Yeah. Um, and, but you know, you're, you're able to get close enough to be able to cast, but they're not using that section of bank or deep water, whatever it is. And, you know, I'm able to watch the fish get up, move around, they'll push, they'll make ripples on top, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you get to learn and be a little more intimate with them. Yeah. Um, and then you can kind of figure out where to move a little bit. This kind of comes a chess game at that point. Definitely. So, uh, I think that's, that's huge. Um, Yep, yeah, I don't have a power pole. Every year I say I'm going to put it on there. It's just that one thing that just kind of gets pushed back. I don't want to spend the money on. Uh, but, you know, in the winter, a lot of times these fish, at least up around our area, you know, where I do a lot of the wintertime fishing, are over sand bottom. Yeah. Um, which is odd, but that's just most of our, our bottom is sand. You know, mm -hmm. you get down in the river, the fish are sitting over mud bottom. A little bit harder to find in the deeper water, but... Um, a power pole really comes in handy. Like I can usually stake out my boat with my push pole, uh, yeah. but it, you don't need a power pole. You don't need a push pole. You can just pull your bank, your boat up into the, the grass, put it on the edge of the grass. But the big thing is just don't bump the fish. Don't get too yeah. aggressive. And if they're going up and down a Creek, like chase them down each way, like casting them one way. I see so many people, even guides that chase fish back and forth on a trolling motor in an area this time of year. 
Mm-hmm. And there is no, because you can't patiently sit back enough to, to wait for them to come back. You know, you're doing yourself a, you know, long term me- messing yourself up by just chasing them back and forth, making them smarter and harder to catch. Yeah. Um, and so just wait back, like Michael said, let those fish, we talked about it earlier, they kind of ping pong back and forth through an area in the winter. Um, mm-hmm. Just, you know, get on that edge and then just sit there and wait. And they'll come back to you. You know, and, and if, if they don't ease up, you know, like move 10, 15 feet up mm-hmm. and sit and wait. Even in crystal clear water, sometimes it can be hard to see them at first. You know, you need oh, yeah. them to be 25, 30 feet away from the boat before you can start to see them. But um, I think that's another thing that's important to talk about. Like these fish this time of year show up in a really, in clear water, really gray color. Yeah. Um, they might just look like really big mullets swimming on the bottom. But mm-hmm. what we really want is them mid water column kind of flashing or they'll float on the surface on a warmer yep. day. So, I'm just rambling. Sorry. Oh no, you're you're good. You you're hitting the hitting the nail on the head there. I was gonna say like we call it winking. Yeah. You know, and that's that's where they're sitting on the bottom. Either a lot of times they're coming in. This is how we spot a lot of fish in transition zones. Sometimes is when they come in from the ocean. They got parasites and different stuff on them, and they'll come in and they'll turn on their sides and hit the bottom and try to rub parasites and stuff off or they'll just go down and try to disturb the bottom and see if they can find food, whatever yeah. it is, depending on where they're sitting. Um, and you'll see them flash like that when they feed too, even midwater column mm-hmm. and above. And I've even seen them just up near the surface. They'll be floating, just rolling on their side. Yep. I don't know what that is all about when they're up, you know, up, up a little bit higher in the water column. Well, the way their face is designed with their mouth, I think they have to turn their head to really kind of be able to see that bait and where their mouth is, you know, and to be yeah. able to strike at it yeah, easier. So versus like when they're chasing the top water or something, they have to get their whole head up out of the water anyways, just to get their mouth in the right spot. Do to you think it. that sometimes they just flash in the water for no reason? Yeah. I think when they're just happy. Yeah. When they're happy. Yeah, you know, when they're, too. they're happy in a school, I think a lot of times when you see them flash is because they can feel the other fish move. You know, they're using their lateral line. They're feeling the water push from other fish, you know, and they'll sit there and they'll flick and turn and stuff. And I think that kind of tells They're kind of talking a little bit. Yeah, right? and it's kind of like, hey, I'm over here. Hey, I'm over here, you know, and give me space or whatever, you know. It's kind of their way of communicating back and forth for sure. Yeah, that's, that's so, huge. I've never even really thought about that, but that's got to be what it is because you'll see them flash over here and then one yeah, flash over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're happy. But they're, yeah, they're, I mean, those fish are using that lateral line for so many reasons like yep. stuff that you'll never pick up on mm-hmm. uh, and that's why when they're in a school and you spook one fish that's 10 feet out in front of the spool, school and he turns that's why every other fish turns at the exact same time because yep. they feel that whoops sorry sorry for everyone listening i just bumped the table uh, but th- they'll feel all those movements like crazy yeah so. and you'll see them do the same thing like when they're out in the surf and they're you know riding in the waves and this is one of the coolest things i think to watch them do um you know, they'll ride in a wave and you're, you look and you see a school of them in the back of a wave somewhere and you'll see them start to flick and flash. And it's normally when the wave's coming over and breaking and they're kind of getting sucked up in it. And I think, you know, they're trying to swim down or swim out of it or, all right, this is as far as we can go, you know, and they'll try to push the school back out and yeah, get it back yeah. out in deeper water, you know? So it's kind of, I don't know, it's just really neat to watch them it is neat. move and I don't really know what it all is means or whatever but <laughs> right. it, uh, it, there's a lot of stuff that we can really dive into and yeah. think about it doesn't really matter but if you see fish flashing oftentimes that means they're happy they're going to eat that's yeah. that's kind of the main rule whether they're on the bottom on the top you know when you see them down on the bottom hugging the bottom dark not flashing not doing anything those fish will eat but they're not as happy they're not as fired up or they're real cold it's a real cold time of year yeah that's kind of what i've found what do you want to go into next? Let's let's talk about, you know, I think it's important to talk about what we like to fish this time of year and what okay. we like to throw to them. So let's go through artificials, but then also talk a little bit about some of the, our bait setups if we're going to bait fish for them. Okay. I'll let you go first. Um, so for artificials, I, I don't know what it is about this time of year, but white is like the one thing I pick up all the time. I, it really stands out in clear water, you know, just as, and I go with smaller the little paddlers by Z-Man that are like kind of Little kinda streaks not, too. Have you fished a little streak for I haven't fished them yet, but I picked up a pack gotcha. the other day. I think they're going to be ticket though. Yeah. Um, but something that three, three and a half inch range, we're really downsizing and changing from that idea of fours and fives and six inch baits that we were coming, you know, fishing during the fall with all the mullet transitions. And now that's pretty much done. It's gone. So the only mullet that are left in the creek are 
what we call hog legs, 14, 15 inches. You yeah. know, they're huge. Um, so, or mud minnows and little stuff. So I try to focus a lot on that. Um, eighth ounce, three sixteenths yeah. at absolute most, depending on that slow water sink. depth. Yeah. And, um, I think that's probably the biggest thing I fish. And then I fish a lot of twitch baits. Yeah. So mirror lures, suspending jerk baits, that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's huge, man. When they're suspending in the water column and they're happy. Yeah. It, you know, the stuff will get down to the bottom and they just won't see it because they're kind of hanging out, looking up. And mm-hmm. you, know, you throw a 17 in there and twitch it, MR17 by mirror lure. They'll, man, they will crush a hard bait this time of year. I don't really yeah. fish hard baits much outside no. of this time of year, but um, this time of year, that mirror lure can get eaten really well. Yeah. Um, I think one of the ways I stray from Michael is, and, and a lot of people, so many people love white this time of year. It's a yeah. great color. But I end up throwing a natural color so much because it's, to me, I'm like, all right, they can definitely see natural better now than when they came in the summer. Yeah. And But for me, I think a lot of times that comes from fishing highly pressured groups of fish to where I want to just have them subtly pick up on it. Like mm-hmm. the big thing with redfish, especially this time of year is, and I say this with clients every single day on the boat, even in the summer, when you're sight fishing, it's easy to just rip the bait right in front of the fish's face, but you want to let that fish feel like they found it. Yeah. You know, a lot of times if they're real fired up, it doesn't matter, but why not take every precaution you can present that bait the best way you can. And so by throwing a natural bait, I can sneak it into that visibility of the fish a little bit easier than like a bright white or chartreuse in shallow, clear water. Yeah. But then again, I'll I'll be like fishing next to someone that has a bright white bait on and they're catching more fish than me some days. And I'm like, I guess it doesn't really matter, you know? Well, and I think too, like last year, especially when we were trout fishing so much and the trout fishing was so good, the the natural color baits for the trout were such a killer that, yeah. you know, we we really got into breaking down, you know, different colors and what exactly Definitely. they keyed in on. Some days it was red flake, sometimes it was gold flake, black flake, whatever, you know. And we started really use well, I know last year I started using it more for redfish because it's right. what I already had tied on when I was trout fishing that day. But, um... So I definitely, yeah, I agree in yeah. that part. But I feel like for years, you know, the white's been the first thing I've kind of picked up to definitely. go for. But <coughs> Excuse me. Don't be afraid either. Like, you, you get two or three warm days this time of year, and you find a school of fish, and they're happy and floating near the surface. They will crush a topwater. Yep. It doesn't have to be summertime to get me to topwater. I'm not, it's not going to be my first bait I throw on, but no. if they're just absolutely crushing stuff, they'll eat a topwater. Mm-hmm. And a lot of days, it's almost more fun. You'll get them like following it and kind of like swiping at it. You're not really getting the hookups, but it's so fun to just watch like six of them pile up behind it and kind of swirl on it. Um, it, it makes you wonder like, all right, why are they chasing it so hard but not mm-hmm. eating it? You know, and it, it's kind of, I wonder if throwing a whopper plopper or a wake bait or something different would get those bites that time of year. But yeah, you can definitely catch them on top water January, February, March. Yeah, uh, Mike's done it. I've done it. You just got to know by reading the fishes, you know, interactions with you and the way they're acting what you need to throw so yeah um I, this is getting me excited i've been like on, i've been duck hunting just nothing but duck hunting trips and so i'm kind of excited for february once duck season's done to do some do a little red fishing thank you it's been a minute since i've caught one personally on a fly rod really yeah i think it's been probably i don't know i don't think i don't know if i've caught one on a fly rod all, i mean i haven't had the opportunity to throw a fly rod at one yeah um i guess probably all summer i would say i guess it was this past spring yeah, probably the last time I got one, just because during the summer I'm always, you know, I don't fish with a lot of guys besides you that fly fish a right, lot. Right. So you know they don't really want to put the time into it, and this is kind of the time of year where I can get the boat in one spot and be able to cast and you For know sure. still let other people fish, or me and you finally get the opportunity to fish together. For sure. So yeah. Yeah, and for me, it's like if I'm fishing by myself, I just throw the spinning rod. I yeah. love. We both love fly fishing. That's our passion, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you said, this is a good time of year. If you get the boat staked out on a school of fish by yourself, you can, you can throw the fly to them. So, and this uh, is a great time if you're a beginner fly fisherman and you're just getting in, you know, getting into the whole sight fishing thing, Yeah. be able to cast in front of those fish, watch what they do, watch how they react to it, watch your angles and all this stuff and letting the bait get to the right depths. And Definitely. there's a whole nother world we could go into, but just that up part. Of yeah, it. I think there is. Um, let's move into that. Like angle is in presentation. I want to share <laughs> one more bait though, that, that worked really well for me last year. 
Um, there's lots of twitch baits and stuff we talked about, but as far as soft plastics, like fishing an actual Ned rig, a really mm-hmm. small mm-hmm. soft plastic. They make little crayfish, little shrimp stuff you can put on there, but like the actual little, they call it like a TRD, which is pretty yeah. much a turd. <laughs> like a little brown or green TRD worm. It's about two and a half inches long mm-hmm. on an Ed rig hook. And it's just subtle. It's little. You can wiggle it a little bit. It almost is like those white worms. I think these redfish eat a lot of the white worms that you see coming out of the sand this time of year. Mm-hmm. Um, I've found them in their stomachs when I've been cleaning fish. And I think that TRD um, or that turd, if you will, is just a, it's a, it's a great bait for those spooky fish. Like if they're yeah. fired up, I'm not going to worry about throwing it. But when I... I need to, you know, sit there and kind of just wiggle something on the bottom real subtly. Um, Throwing that that Ned rig is is money. It it works really, really well. And I think, too, with the Ned rig, like you said, being able to throw it and get it in the right position and it being small, light, it's quiet. Yeah, super quiet. When you hit the water, it doesn't put out a giant wake on the top. It doesn't splash. It doesn't do... It just kind of bloop. (laughs) It's just there. It sinks pretty quick, too. It'll get down there, so... It's good for like close quarters if they're sneaking up on you. You can get it down there and wiggle it real quick and get some bites closer to the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, let's let's move into with that angles and presentation and where to cast, where not to cast. Okay. Um, I think for me the biggest thing is don't cast in the middle of the school. Yeah. Do not cast when you cross, you know, across the school. And the reason for that is, is you know, we're talking fisher and more than likely two foot. Yeah. Or less of water. Foot and a half to three and a half feet. Yeah, I was going to say, don't hold that, you know, because there's Maybe a lot of... Maybe six or seven. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a few exceptions there. Um, we'll get into that on Patreon. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will. Um, but no, the, you know, if you cast across the school and your line bumps one of those fish in the middle of the school, you know, that fish is going to freak out. It's going to wonder what the heck just happened. And that's the biggest way to put a school down, push a school out, Definitely. and turn them off. Um, or just laying in a bait right in the middle of them. Some days they are fired up, and if you have a bad cast, it's whatever. But if you're constantly doing it, cast after cast after cast. You're educating them. Yeah, and they're going to get agitated because that's not what's supposed to happen naturally, yeah. and they're going to move on or just completely shut down and sit down on the bottom. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's uh, they're, they're smart fish for sure, yeah. but um, they're, they're simple fish at, the, at that, you know, mm-hmm. and... and they're they're gonna learn by all right every time this thing darts in here, we all like a second later we all freak out and so they're you're training them like oh you know they might eat they might be fired up that day and eating it if you throw it right in the middle of them yeah but then they're starting to put together like okay this thing comes flying in from above and then we all freak out and we're scared from it it takes us a minute to regroup like think real simply like that and mm-hmm. and it, it definitely helps you when when trying to figure out these fish's habits this time of year um, and like we said like the smarter and safer and less intrusive we can be on these schools of fish the better they're going to eat and the longer they're going to stick around this time of year so yeah and i think too a big thing is is like you you're going to put together once you start you know watching these fish you know if they're swimming around in a certain area of the creek and they're making either a certain circle or a certain pass in a certain direction you you can eventually you'll learn or see them coming or whatever it is and get your bait out in front of them, let it sit there. That's kind of my big thing. Let it sit there 10, 15 seconds before those fish pass by. You're able to watch them. Once they start moving that direction and you're, you know, three, four, five feet off in front of them and you want the bait to be, I would say, quartering away from them. Yeah. You know, where it's crossing their face, but it's not coming right at them. Yeah, or straight you're across. still moving away at some amount. Yeah. Um, you know, get it right there. Twitch, 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 slow. You know, if they get closer and they don't seem like they're reacting to it, maybe speed it up a little bit or whatever. You know, pick your rod zip up so it comes up off the bottom more, you know, and you'll kind of read those fish and their reaction. Yeah. But you're mainly fishing the front of the school of fish. Yeah. Um, and then there's other options, too. I mean, I know I've got some guys that I fish with. They don't cast well. They're not accurate at all. You know, I give them a jig head with a piece of shrimp or a circle hook with a piece of shrimp, put it on, cast it out let the school swim over it they can smell they eat shrimp just as well in the back of a creek or wherever it is as they do out of the jetty or near shore yeah so yeah. you know you that's a great option but it is a very educating option yeah. <laughs> after a few fish like that a lot of times they will shut down to the shrimp so yeah there, there's uh 
but when they're dude there's some days where they'll just pound that shrimp yeah. all day <laughs> um, but it's uh again you know like just keep it simple and, and catch a couple and get out of there but yeah. um yeah, like Mike said, and we talked about earlier, letting those fish find the bait is, is key. Mm-hmm. Um, my perfect scenario is the fish are kind of traveling back and forth. You're off the school and they don't feel you. You pitch it in front of where they're heading to. Let the first couple of fish swim over that jig or whatever you throw to them. And then just start picking it up, hopping a little bit. And usually you get back into the middle of those school. the school. Those are the fish that are the most comfortable. Yeah. You know, they've got all these other fish around them and you'll get eaten immediately. Almost yeah. if you start, if you let it get back in there and start wiggling a little bit. Um and yeah, that that's kind of my presentation basis. If it's a mirror lure, same deal. Um, I, I'm trying to kind of like let it get out in front of that group of fish, let them swim into it, and then start moving it. You know, I don't want to yeah. rip it in from the side of, of, of them. I want them those first couple of fish to maybe swim around it and then twitch it once it's in there and it's going to get eaten. Yeah. Um, but it's fun with those mirror lures because you can see them so well. It's like have them near the edge of the school and whack whack, and you watch these fish peel off of it and come smack mm-hmm. them. Um, it's a, it's a fun, it's a definite, very fun bite. So, Heck yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else with these, you know, with schooling wintertime redfish that we can go into? Oh, rod setup maybe. Yeah. It, it's a good time of year to throw a pretty light setup. Yeah. You know, 2,500 medium light. I was going to say, I mean, these fish for the most part, you know, a lot of them are smaller. You're going to find some bigger fish in these schools yeah. or a couple schools of, bigger fish yeah like that 20 to 24 25 yeah it, you know that's kind of i wouldn't say that's our max but that's that's getting to the top of right. what our max is around here for our winter time red schools um so yeah i mean downsize have fun with it yeah you know the water's cool you're not gonna i mean obviously don't go out there with like a thousand trying you know a 1000 size reel trying to land them but you know if you want to downsize you can fight that fish enjoy the fight on a lighter setup definitely um and really be able to enjoy it so no i agree i i think it's a good time of year to get away with something lighter and if you're pitching these little soft jig heads and Mm -hmm. um you know with with small soft plastics it's nice to have a little bit smaller setup you can actually feel it better and work it better you're not yeah you know a bigger clunkier reel you're moving that bait a lot more than you think you are Mm -hmm. uh, with one rotation of the reel so um i usually will fish you know anything from 15 16 pound test down to 10 or 10 or 8 pound test in the winter yeah um, I, I'll fish as much as I can get away with for sure. Exactly. But if those fish are spooky, you know, I'll drop it down to 12. Usually 12 with redfish is about as light as I need to go. Yeah. 12. Um, Sometimes I'll do fluorocarbon just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Cause that's what I've already got tied on for trout. Yeah, know? definitely. Definitely. But if you are fishing though, for, and you've got bigger redfish and you're fishing 12 or 10 pound tests, like make sure you got a soft tipped rod and make sure that, or, and, and, or, and, and, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> fish a lighter tipped rod because when you set the hook on a you know a 26 inch redfish with eight pound test Mm -hmm. and and you're setting it like you're setting on a trout you know with a lighter setup you're gonna break that fish off you know and so so lighten that drag up a little bit softer tip rod helps out and definitely be be conscious you know if you hook a fish and you break off a jig head and it's you know count that as a caught fish you've already you know maybe you didn't get it a hand but you're leaving that fish with a reminder that you know, it might take him a day or two or three before he either gets rid of the jig head, the jig head's gone, or whatever that you were fishing breaks off yeah. before that fish really was going to come back and feed probably again. So, you know, if you go in there and you break off 10, 15 jig heads, they're going to still be there maybe for another few days. But if you keep pounding them and pressuring them, they're just, they're going to turn off. They're going to be done. Yeah, definitely. You know, so take your time once you find them and you catch one or two you know be conscious if you're going to step your gear down yeah so yeah i agree it's uh it's 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 the time of year to be go out there and catch some numbers but be smart about it don't don't beat them up too bad don't don't um i don't know just care about the fish a little more yeah (laughs) (laughs) uh well sweet well i think that kind of covers you know the majority of what i wanted to hit today it's all about just getting out there and covering some water and finding those fish anyone can find them if you roll across them this time of year you're going to find them and this podcast is a little more specifically based on our area you know Mm -hmm. like in louisiana some of your georgia fishing like you're not going to deal with this quite as much as we do in these clear water red fisheries like uh here up through virginia and some of these clearer marshes um but it's it's a good time of year no matter what kind of estuary you're in to find redfish schooled up like yeah. um and, and so 
and anytime you find fish that are consistently hanging out in an area, these rules of like, you know, don't beat up on them too much. They, they come to, into play. Like, I don't care if it's, you know, single spread out in an area or a big school, like the more you educate them in one spot, the harder they're going to be to catch. So, yeah. um, you know, there's some spots here that have big numbers of fish in them that I don't even really mess with anymore. Cause it can be so frustrating to go in there. Like redfish should eat something every time you throw it to them. Yeah. Typically, unless it's freezing cold. Mm-hmm. Um, or you've had a big, big weather change, but they're usually pretty active and consistent fish. You put something in front of them, they eat it, um, especially bait. And, and too much pressure on fish can make them not even eat, you know, yeah. fresh shrimp. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's just a way that we can, you know, ha- catch more fish ourselves and help others have more effect- effective ways out there. I know this is sounding just like a, a big pitch, but it is so important this time of year to take care of our fish. So um, yeah. can you think of anything else that we're missing? No, and I think, you know, you were talking about this area, you know, you get into darker water, like river water, yeah. that kind of stuff, um, whether you're down around Charleston, even lower Cape Fear River here, you know, Georgia, some of the big river in, rivers that come in down there, you know, same ideas hold true, but there's little nuances for sure mm. um, of where those fish like to hang out and what exactly because it's a difference in that sand bottom and a mud bottom, you know, of what exactly those key puzzle pieces are to put together to make up their habitat or their zone or where they want to be at and be yeah. comfortable. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's uh, that's pretty big right there, man. Well, like we said earlier, we are going to dive really into exactly what we look for in an area that's going to hold redfish this time. You can almost go there. Or you can go there and pick a spot before the fish even show up and, and know fish are going to be in this spot this winter um, at some point. What, what, whatever temperature they like, whatever you know kind of moon phase they want to push them to the area. And we're going to share how to find those areas with you on our Patreon page um, and, and dive a little bit more into this conversation. But you guys, we thank you all so much for tuning into these podcasts. We've grown this podcast. Y'all have grown this podcast. Um, and it's just cool to see the the positive feedback we have on it. And we love creating this stuff and, and sharing with y'all. We think the more successful anglers there are on the water, the louder voice we have for conservation. And yep. so that's kind of our argument when people are like, hey, why do you share all this information with people? You know, and shorten the learning curve for people. We think we want you to go out there and we want you to be successful, but we want you to in return, you know, speak up for, for these resources, whether it's in North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. We are the voice as the fishermen, as the hunters. We're the voice for conservation um, of that resource. So I think that's that's it. That's Guys, right. thanks for checking it out. Mike, thanks for coming on. <laughs> and we will, uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Later.